speech and everything else. Yeah, actually, I was uh, born in uh, Massachusetts. Where you And my uh, yeah. dad, uh, uh, at that time, back in 1952, decided that they wanted to move to, to California because that was the land of opportunity, you know. And uh, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was probably kind of a, not a wild kid, but I... Uh, I had my issues, you know, growing up, and uh, my parents sent me off to military school, and uh, I spent four years in military school. Where was that? It was a Spolvita Military Academy there in Cold the San Fernando Valley, oh. yeah. and uh, so I was in the California Cadet Corps for like four years, and then I went back to public high school, and I went to San Fernando High School yeah. and graduated well, from Well, was there. the boxing something to, <laughs> yeah. uh, as a youth to get you in control, or? Well, I... I always liked it. My dad uh, enjoyed boxing, and I enjoyed baseball, and uh, I kind of liked football, but baseball was kind of my love. And uh, but I did some boxing, and uh, uh, there's kind of a funny story. One of the uh, they used to have a TV show called Kid Loves back in uh, Los Angeles, a local uh, uh, TV mm -hmm. show, and. Uh, my dad took me there to audition, and the guy that ran it used to be Gene Fulmer. You remember Gene Fulmer? He used to be the middleweight champion of the world. Yep. It was his manager that was in. So I got in the ring against some other kids of my size, and I was a pretty good size at that time. And he said, nah, he says, he says you're, you're too strong for those kids. So he says, he says, but I'll manage you. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't want to become a prize fighter or anything. So anyhow, I grew up and uh, uh, went to high school, graduated from high school, San Fernando High School. And I tried one year of college. I wasn't ready, so I went into the Army. Was, and that was California Lutheran? Uh, well, no, no, I went to, uh, was that prior to a, jun that? a junior college prior to that. Uh, for just a, just a year, and uh, I decided I wasn't ready for college yet, so I went into the Army, and I uh, got out of the Army. Uh, I served as a reservist, and served, uh, five, I think, five years as a reservist, but active duty for a little over six months. This still in Los Angeles? Still in Los Angeles, yeah. And that's and, where you were in the reserves when we saw the picture from the 65 watts? Right, right. Underneath yeah. the Jeep there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, and that was an interesting time, a period of time. And uh, Yeah, that was the front page of the LA Times, mm -hmm. that, that picture. And it was kind of interesting. So anyhow, I came from, I came out of that and uh, I had always wanted to be in law enforcement. I mean, I, since I was a kid, I don't know why. I just so out of curiosity, what did your what did your father do? My dad was a, a workaholic. He was a mailman during the day and worked full time at night as a machinist. Huh? He worked for Lockheed and various other aerospace companies mm -hmm. as a machinist. But he had two full time jobs uh, and uh, um, probably worked himself to death <laughs> at a young age. So, but. So anyhow, I, when I, then I went to work for um, North American Aviation, and I had the opportunity to work on the, the Saturn project for about uh, two years. And I think there's a picture on uh, the website. The battleship. The battleship, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the second stage of the Saturn rocket. Yeah. And I used to, uh, I was in charge of going up on that and making sure all the instruments were calibrated on the, the battleship. And, uh, How often did you fire that? Not very often. Probably in that two-year period, probably four or five times. Mm -hmm. So and uh, big noise. I big suspect. noise. Yeah, it uh, used to shake the San Fernando Valley and Simi Valley, which is on oh, the that? other side. Mm -hmm. It used to shake that whole area. And uh, then I went. Then I. Uh, then I just decided that. They were going to move that project to Huntsville, Alabama, and I really didn't want to move to Huntsville, so I decided to stay, and I applied for to become get into law enforcement, uh, and I went to work as a, uh, a deputy marshal for uh, eleven years, and uh, had a wonderful experience there. I uh, I had every 
prime job there was. I got to be the uh, bodyguard for the presiding judge of all Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, for about a year and a half. And uh, I worked fugitives for uh, about seven years. And I was in charge, uh, second in command of a, a small substation in the, the city of San Fernando. And I got to do everything pretty well. And I was, by, by that time, I was, I started back into college and uh, went to college under what they call the LEAP program, Law Enforcement Educational Program. And that was a federal program that allowed police officers to, to go to school and if you stayed for two years afterwards, they would pay the tuition for the previous two good, years. Good deal. And so I went all the way up through uh, Cal Lutheran. I, I transferred over to Cal Lutheran. I got my bachelor's degree and then I got my master's degree two years later. Mm -hmm. By the time I got my master's degree, I was, I was married, had two little kids, and quite honestly at the time, I could see a big change in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I did So we're in the early 70s now? Yeah, we're in the early 70s, yeah. And uh, it wasn't a good change. And uh, so I decided, my wife and I, who was a native here of uh, Linda is from here? Linda's from here, yeah. She's a CSU grad. Where did you meet her? <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> I met her in a nightclub in San, Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. We were dancing on top of a table, and she caught me drinking out of her boyfriend's pitcher of beer. <laughs> is this edited? <laughs> It can be. So, so, no, no, I don't care. But anyhow, uh, you know, when, uh, so anyhow, we got married in 69, uh, and then we have two young girls, and uh, uh, I just didn't want to st stick around in Los Angeles anymore, and I had been out here, we had been but vacationing. there was a car of a connection with Linda that yeah. had gone to CSU? Yeah, she graduated from CSU, and she was hired uh, right out of college. Uh, she was an auditor for the uh, Defense Contract Audit Agency. Mm -hmm. And she was assigned to do Howard Hughes and Robert Mayhew's books mm -hmm. for uh, the uh, Defense Contract Audit Agency back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And it was, that was kind of interesting. And so anyhow, she worked for a few years and uh, we started having children. And so anyhow, uh, and I had got my graduate degree, so we said, you know, this is not the place we want to stay and raise our children. And so we moved back out here to Colorado. What was your first job here? Well, I was originally hired as an agent for the railroad, for Santa Fe Railroad. But the job wasn't coming open till October. So I moved out in May and I went to work for Arapahoe County for like four or five months until this job came open. Because they opened the job for me. And uh, so I just worked as a deputy here at uh, Rapaho for like the four or five months. And then my job came open as a special agent for Santa Fe. And I worked for them for almost five years. Mm -hmm. Assigned basically my area of assignment was basically from Denver down uh, to almost Pueblo and then out east to, uh, to Kansas basically. What, what was your job? Uh, the title was special agent. Special agent, basically, it's uh, kind of mean? it's kind of a combination between a, a risk manager and a police police uh, detective. Uh, mainly, I investigated crimes against the railroad and uh, tried to find uh, incidences of uh, safety violations, that type of thing. And uh, I guess there were enough of those that that was a full time job. Oh in yeah, their that's territory. A, Safety is a very big part of railroad operations, and they put a lot of money into that. And I really enjoyed the job. I, I really did. I uh, I had a wonderful experience with them. And but as it is with any big company, and being a part of management, if they wanted you to move, they expected you to move. And uh, I didn't want to move. So uh, did they ask you to move once? No, but I was suspecting that they might, and uh, because they had offered me a job in Chicago, and I turned it down. I said I really, I didn't want to live in Chicago. <laughs> so, and uh, 
so anyhow, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that they were going to eventually move me somewhere else. And uh, so, and at that time, all the problems were happening in the sheriff's office here, and I got to know a lot of the, uh, the deputies and a lot of people in law enforcement along the front range here. And they came to me and they said, we don't like who's running for sheriff in Douglas County. Would you be interested in running? So I did some research and I said, well, I'll try. And Were you uh, a Douglas County resident at that time? Yes. Yeah. 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 I had, while my house was being built in Surrey Ridge there, um, um, uh, I was living over in Littleton. But by the time uh, I ran for sheriff, yeah, I had been living in Douglas County okay. for uh, four years or something like that. Um, so, uh, and I had bought that property up there in Surrey Ridge as an investment. And then once we moved out here, we said, well, you know, we like the area so much, let's build there. So, yeah. so that's, that's really how that came into being. So anyhow, the, the Sheriff's Department was having all these problems, and uh, um, so they convinced me to run, and I ran, and mm -hmm. ran against a retired FBI agent. Beat him pretty substantially in the primary, and then in the general election, I really had no opponent, and uh, so it went on from there. So it, I have, I've been a pretty lucky guy, I have to say. I have every position and every opportunity that I've had uh, has been a wonderful experience. So I've never had a job where it wasn't. Well, I understand one of your first priorities as the new sheriff of a growing county <clears throat> was to see if you could solve the problem of the sheriff's office not having a place to train. Right, that was Particularly one firearms training. That right. You were at the Douglas County Fairgrounds at that point? Yes, yeah, we were at the Douglas County Fairgrounds just a couple hundred yards from Wilcox Street. Well, I firing, that wasn't good. Firing into a berm that yeah. was that ran alongside uh, Wilcox. Not good. Not good, and very unsafe. And by my being exposed to some of the other sheriffs and police chiefs in the metro area here, nobody had a reasonable place to do any training. Every what was Arapaho doing at that point? Arapaho was shooting down in a gully right down here at the end of Broadway. Yeah. And uh, they had no place to go. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, Aurora PD had a small range that you could probably put five to 10 people on. And These are outdoor ranges now? And it was out to, out of Lurie, Lowry, by mm -hmm. Lowry yeah. Air Base there. And, uh, but then you had to schedule it and you had to make that long drive out there and, it, it really didn't kind of avail itself to the type of training that needed to be done. It was just basically shoot at a single target, do your shooting, and then leave. And uh, so anyhow, it was a big issue for all, especially the agencies in the South Metro area. And so I kind of assigned my undersheriff to go out and try to find a place where we could build our own facility. And he did that. And Seems like every place that we found, somebody else had uh, uh, plans for, you know. And uh, kind of a funny story, uh, the, the last place was the old Arapaho dump there at Colorado and, uh, four, and 470, there used to be the old dump there. And uh, we had told the commissioners that uh, if they're gonna take that out of service, why not give it to us and we can open a firearms facility. About a week later, I got this call from the, the former president of Mission Viejo, Jim Teffer, and he says, I heard you want to build a range out on Colorado and 470. And I says, yeah, we have it already designed. He says, well, we're going to build homes there. <laughs> and I said, oh. And uh, he said, give me two weeks. And so he, I gave him two weeks, and he said, meet me down at where we are now, just uh, about a mile and a half south of Titan Road, and, and 
He said, well, what do you think about this place? So him and Joe Blake and I and my under sheriff went out there. He says, well, lease you this property for a dollar a year for the next 99 years. And I said, you can't beat that. So yeah. we said, we'll take it. That was about the same time that uh, Jim Tepper was growing tired of Lawrence Phipps's antics. Oh yeah, yeah. As the the tenant on the ranch property, right. And eventually, he was telling the uh, Arapaho Hunt Club that to, they had to find another place. Right, right, At right. Least according to what I remember, Jim Tepper said. Yeah, it was. It, it, uh, he was growing tired of them. But right. They had built starting in '79. Right. As I understand it stables for 50 horses and kennels for 100 English foxhounds. Oh, yeah. So there were structures there. There were structures there. And there's yeah. a, kind of an interesting story on that, too. Um, you want to tell it? Yeah, back in, uh, I can't remember the year now, but uh, it might have been late 1980s, early 1990s, that big long barn that they had built wasn't built to code. Well, what happened was they had put the, uh, the heating system up against the wood. Well, anyhow, it caught fire <laughs> and it burned and it caught fire and burned. And uh, we had just received a donation of like 250 solid core doors for training purposes. And we were insured by Lloyd's of London mm -hmm. for that property. And Lloyd said, well, we're going to write you a check for $180,000. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so we were able to build our first building. And this was a solid metal structure. Yeah, building. solid metal structure, yeah. It's, and now yeah. it serves as our uh, maintenance building and uh, a storage building and, uh, and an office for our facilities maintenance people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Um, so anyhow, there have been many additions that have yeah, occurred right. to that during your tenure uh, quite, quite as sheriff sure. and even afterwards. Right, right, yeah. Uh, later on, uh, uh, Mission sold out in 1992, I believe it was, to uh, Shea Homes. And uh, we had already put together a board and so forth, but we weren't incorporated yet. And the board was made up, uh, I guess I should step back a little bit. When we originally got the property, it was only for, going to be for us. That's what Teffer wanted. And uh, but anyhow, this is 1983, 85, 85, 85. Yeah, and uh, Teffer only wanted it for us, and so did Joe Blake. But Arapahoe County Sheriff had a grant that had been sitting in the bank for several years to build a range, but they had no place to build it. And uh, so I contacted the sheriff then, and uh, we got together, and he said, well, if we can be part of your facility, mm -hmm. we'll put the money in that to building the first range. So and that was Dan Sullivan? That was Pat Sullivan. Pat Sullivan. Yeah, and yeah. that was 1986. Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, we formed a board and primarily made up of Arapaho uh, employees, Douglas County employees, a member of Mission Viejo, which was Joe Blake, and uh, a couple of citizens. And uh, that went on for several years, and then we started to develop, and uh, other agencies liked what we were doing. We had built a couple more ranges and so forth, primarily with the use of uh, uh, prisoner help and uh, donations and that type of stuff. And uh, everybody liked what we were doing, and so people started saying, well, we would like to belong. So we decided we would open it up to other agencies, because we had a lot of space. It, the, and have you ever been in, have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know that most of the ranges are built in like uh, f fingers, you know, the kind of natural burbs. Yeah. And so it basically, lent itself to the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, up toward Rocky Top. Yeah, and uh, so anyhow, the bottom line was uh, we said, well, we'll just start charging agencies per member, and uh, that's the way we can create a budget and uh, do future development and run uh, the operations. 
1992, like I say, uh, Mission sold out to uh, Shea Holmes, and uh, some of the same people stayed with Shea that were with Mission. And so we, that transition worked out real well for us because Shea came in and they became our partner and they had the same attitude about law enforcement and supporting law enforcement. And it developed like that uh, for, for many years and today we have 64 member agencies that represent 28, 2900 officers that utilize the facility and uh, it's developed way beyond what we ever expected. Uh, we have the State Sheriff's Association is headquartered out there. Uh, we have those 64 agencies plus eight ranges and uh, our own uh, maintenance building where we can fabricate, fab fabricate and pretty much do anything. We have uh, all kinds of digital training systems um, we have the only what they call live fire shoot house pretty much in the state and uh, that's where the officers can go in with live rounds and, and shoot 360 degrees and uh, I mean we continue to build and improve we have a, a, a real uh, state-of-the-art repelling tower out there now and uh, so it's been quite an adventure it's been very well received by law enforcement. And even from time to time, the military uses it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, it's not been public yet. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not a secret either, but it hasn't been public. But the uh, military it comes out every two years and does what they call vital connection. It's a uh, military exercise that goes on for a week that everybody that is a first responder in the state and some from other states comes here, sets up their communications vans, and they try to talk to each other. And the whole idea is if there was ever a natural, natural disaster or there was ever any type of need for military communications with local government or state government, they would be able to network immediately. And you've actually tested it there. And we, we tested there. We've already done it three times now over the, the history. And they also do what uh, is kind of the state of the art today. They do a uh, cyber um, attack mm -hmm. response from, mobile, from a mobile location. They say it's easy to do it from Washington, D.C. or some other thing. But if they ever had to do it from the field, it's a lot different. And so they do an exercise related to a, a, a cyber attack. And uh, we just had it this last year in July. So, and, uh, so anyhow, it's become uh, kind of an international uh, model. The uh, Mexican government sent a delegation up here from the State Department Interesting. last year and uh, to look at our facility and, learn about our training methods and that type of thing. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you've had involvement on that from the get-go. From the very get-go, yeah. yeah. I'm one of the founders. I still even, see, after, even after you were a sheriff. Right. I'm, I'm still on the board of directors for yeah. the foundation, yeah. 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 Well, one of the um, <clears throat> latest things that I suspect you've had involvement with would be the um, emergency vehicles training facility that's kind of getting started in Douglas County thanks to a grant from the Linegers. Right. Absolutely. Certainly you had a shovel at groundbreaking, so I assume you had something to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, we had originally designed a drive facility for our property out there at the, at the range, but it was the, the land didn't lend itself to a driving facility. <clears throat> so it gets had, a little hilly there. Yeah, and we had so we had been looking around, and uh, thanks to uh, Holly and uh, our present sheriff uh, Spurlock, uh, we ended up finding a piece of property from uh, that Dupont was trying to get rid of, and uh, they ended up buying that piece of property, and uh, I was asked to be on a uh, research committee and we traveled all over the United States looking at best practices and other facilities. 
and tried to take the best things from those facilities. We went to Washington State, Michigan, Texas, um, where else? We went somewhere else, and I can't even remember. These are all places that have uh, tracks, drive, so drive facilities. Have tracks yeah. already. And uh, we put together a plan, and uh, uh, the commissioners at that time had just changed, and uh, we were told that unless we came up with a significant portion of the money, we wouldn't be able to do the project, even though we already owned the land. And so, Holly and Spurlock ended up uh, uh, getting with uh, Dave Leninger and, and his group. And in fact, the now co-CEO of, uh, of, of Remax, of Remax it used to work for me as okay. a deputy. Yep. He was a lieutenant for me as a, an investigator, so Good. Adam Contos. So mm -hmm. he started. So you just uh, you just broke ground on that about a year ago. What's yes. happened since then? Uh, well, we've developed a, a plan for the future, and uh, we're well, you starting. Picked a, you picked a contractor. Yeah, it's built. It's built. Oh, it's yeah. built. And if you want to tour someday, uh, let me know, and yeah, I'd be happy uh, to take you out there and look. Yeah, Nancy Linson Bickler course is responsible with, with the historical society here for okay. tours in fact we've got a tour that she arranged uh, oh. with somebody at the, of the justice center oh okay coming up here just February. in a couple weeks isn't it February. yeah so yeah we'd love to okay. we'd love to at least coordinate that we think that would be of interest for our members sure yeah anytime uh, you want to do that uh, just let me know just give me some okay. time I'll give you all and uh, it is uh, it is it's a nice facility. It really has turned out very nice. In fact, we have a contract with Lockheed. They're doing their autonomous military vehicles, testing them out there at the, the mm -hmm. facility. And uh, we're making a, an arrangement with uh, some of the car dealers uh, and so forth. They're going to go out there and pay us to take pictures and, and uh, put on, uh, not racing, but just car shows and that type of thing, yeah. plus the agencies that are members of our foundation that do use the range have the ability to go out there and use the facility as well. So it's been a benefit to everything. So the activity is picked up? Yes, it's picked up and now it's going it's, to be picked now up. Now that it's built? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a, a secret for a lot of people in Douglas County who don't get, a, don't get out in that area of the county much. You know, you'd have brought up the Justice Center. There's kind of a funny story in that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're ready to go to that, but uh, if if you do, uh, I think it's kind of a funny story. Sure. Go ahead. Well, back in, uh, gosh, I can't even remember it. It's one bad thing about getting older. You can't remember dates and things like that. But, uh, when I first stepped into being the sheriff, uh, the first thing I knew was the facility that we were at was inadequate. And I This was on Wilcox? Yes, on Wilcox, on the very south end of Wilcox. And uh, it was built in a floodplain. Yeah. And uh, you, right might, you might remember all there. those stories. Yeah, one of those gullies. And uh, I kind of went to battle with uh, some of the commissioners at the time because uh, they were sticking me with this facility that didn't meet, meet any of the accreditation standards and so forth facilities. It was totally inadequate for both the courts and for a jail and for our law enforcement needs. And so we kind of went to battle for a little bit. I mean, I eventually I got pretty good support from the commissioners. And, but, uh, and then we got sued for overcrowding back in, jeez, uh, it must have been the beginning of the 90s, I think. And uh, we and we were able to mitigate all the, the, the areas of the lawsuit except the overcrowding and the inadequate facility. And uh, so anyhow, we ended up going to court and uh, I had to testify in court, federal court, in front of the Judge Mache. Do you remember Mache? Mm -hmm. Hardcore, very stern individual was uh, the presiding judge of the, the Denver District Courts, federal courts. And uh, we had the county attorney sitting there representing the county, and then I had a 
an attorney as well representing me because there was some conflict between the two of us. And you were the sheriff. Right. The county sheriff. Right. And then there was uh, the, the attorney for the, uh, the federal government. And uh, I had gone through all the steps that I had taken to bring to the attention of the commissioners the problems with the facility, the overcrowding issues, and all that. And I'll remember this to this day. Judge Mage says, wait a minute, Sheriff. Here I'm testifying. I'm scared to death. <laughs> and he says, wait a minute, Sheriff. He says, I want you to know I have no problem with sheriffs. He says, I have problems with commissioners. And he looks right at the county attorney. I saw the county attorney's, I saw the blood in his neck turn red. And I said, oh, we're getting a new facility. <laughs> And is that how the Christensen Center for Justice comes Yes, started? yeah, that's how it got started. And that's how it uh, got off the ground and uh, got started. How long did it take to get that design and built? <sighs> that was good. Uh, we were, we went, I took a whole team of people to uh, uh, back east and we went to what the, uh, a program put on by the National Institute of Corrections. It's called PONY, it's Planning of New Institutions. And so we took several members from our department and uh, the, the commissioner, one of the couple of the commissioners and uh, other citizens that were involved in kind of the politics of Douglas County. And we went through this program and we went through the planning and then, then we did an RFP for a design and so forth. And we ended up with uh, HLK, which is a very top-notch architect. Uh, they, matter of fact, they built... They did Coors Field. Coors Field, right. And, uh, and uh, the field in Baltimore. Yes. Yeah. Actually, you, you know a lot of stuff. Well, huh? just like you, I kind of like the Rockies, yeah. too. So anyhow, HOK, yeah. uh, Helmuth, Obata, well, I can't even remember. But anyhow, Casaboom is the last one. But anyhow, they, uh, they planned a, a very nice facility, very state-of-the-art, and uh, we went out and held hearing after hearing after hearing with the public and and uh, in, in that year 1994 I think it was we had a uh, an, uh, an initiative put on the ballot by the commissioners to uh, for a sales tax to, to build a facility. And, and if you remember back in the history of that time, things were very, very tight economically. It was the only issue in the state that passed by such a high, uh, high majority. So I was really happy about that. And uh, so anyhow, we got off the road, we had a good plan. And uh, we built the facility, at least the first phase of the facility. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, the commissioner that was uh, kind of the lead for the board uh, passed away. And that was Robert Christensen. And so they named the facility after him. I see. So, so. Was it named after Don? No, no, not named after Don. Who was a very good, wonderful undersheriff. He was an undersheriff? Yeah, Don Christensen. Yeah. Yeah, Don Christensen was my undersheriff. Yeah. Yeah, he was my undersheriff for the whole 20 years I was mm -hmm. sheriff. And very, very capable guy. So, toward the end of your term, the new Justice Center got built. And come around <clears throat> your 20th anniversary, 2003, <clears throat> you um, weren't the sheriff anymore. Right. That all, well, that all shake out. I got caught up in term limits, and uh, they passed the term limits thing, and so I had two more times that I could run, and mm -hmm. my last uh, date basically was 2003, and uh, and quite honestly, I was about ready to say 20 years is enough. Anyhow, I had done a lot of things, and uh, the department grew basically from 47 people to. Uh, just 384, I think, is when I left. And uh, we were, uh, without bragging, we were the, the top, one of the top law enforcement agencies in the state. Uh, everybody looked to us for leadership and uh, for 
creativity and that type of thing. And uh, so we had also started, uh, I don't know if this is significant, one of the other projects I was kind of uh, uh, responsible for was uh, developing a uh, regional uh, computer forensic center. And it was up at the, uh, where that little substation used to be at uh, Lincoln and uh, Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And we started that there and uh, uh, it was off, uh, up and running and uh, it was very successful. And then uh, the FBI came along and kind of bought us out. Yeah, that's where all the computer crime stuff, and right, yeah. people looking for right. pedophiles. And right, and we were just happens. way ahead of way ahead of the technology. And uh, but uh, you know the FBI came along and they wanted to develop their own, and they didn't want to compete with us, so they basically bought us out. And uh, the deputy director still is a member of the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, assigned to the FBI regional computer mm -hmm. lab. So that's why that position is always filled by one of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let's go back a little bit in time. You started in 83 as the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Mission Viejo, first homeowners, really only moved in in the fall of 81. So right. there weren't many people out here at that point. 20 years later, oh. the population was considerably larger. It's approaching 100,000 people now, mm -hmm. almost at full build out, 36 years later at wow. this point. What type of challenges did you face and how did you handle that with, as you said, the most rapidly growing county for 20 years running? Has well, it impacted your department staff? Oh, and providing yeah. Uh, yeah. the services that uh, supported your mission. Yeah. I, it impacted us greatly, obviously. Uh, we had to develop uh, management uh, practices that uh, would reassign people to higher density areas. Uh, we had to cut response times, that type of thing. But I always had the facility, uh, or the I always had the philosophy that if you train your deputies well, they can they can handle more, and if you pay them well, they can they will stay here. And I tried to convince the commissioners of that, and uh, we started to get some help. We started to bring the salaries up. We uh, we put a lot of money into training the, the people, and uh, we started to get support. Once we got the support of the public. Things went along real well, and part of that was here in, in uh, Highlands Ranch because a lot of the influx of um, people coming to Highlands Ranch were uh, a little more educated, demand, expecting a little bit more. We had a company here at that time, Mission Viejo, and then later Shea, that had a real interest in making sure that creating a community that didn't have adequate law enforcement didn't affect their ability to market their homes and their community. So uh, we really, we developed fast. We went from, like I say, 47 employees to 384 in, in uh, 20 years. We went from deputies actually being, getting subsistence to, at that time, uh, very well paid deputies and uh, the educational level I put educational levels on uh, uh, supervision and uh, put develop standards and policy manuals and so forth none of that was there when I took office mm -hmm. there was no there was nothing here in fact I remember the first time when I ran for sheriff well, when you have 47 people you don't yeah. You have the problems you have when you have 384. Right, right. Um, walking, everything that was uh, here at Highlands Ranch was really at the corner of Dad Clark and Broadway. And I it remember the first intersection. there was probably, what, 50 homes here at the time yeah. when I was uh, running. And I remember walking around the neighborhood and uh, getting an idea of what people expected. And, uh, and of course, I came from uh, an area where uh, training was pretty important, and 
well paid. We were well paid. Yeah. So I never left to Los Angeles because I wasn't well paid. I left Los Angeles because I didn't like the change in, in California. But, uh, so anyhow, um, things went along well, but like I say, after one term, really, and people saw what I was doing, you wouldn't believe the people used to come to the commissioner's hearings and they said, we don't care about all this other crap. Give us, give us adequate law enforcement in our communities. And it went along very well. When did you start building substations? Oh, that was way later. That was, uh, the first substation really was, uh, we had one that really wasn't a substation. We had one up by uh, the district one, up by Deckers. Oh, and, way up uh, there. Yeah. yeah. That was another funny story. Anyhow, we had that almost immediately because we had to do something to keep... How far back can I go? <laughs> when, I, when I first became sheriff, we had a 82-year-old reserve deputy that the sheriff had given a gun to, and he was supposed to take care of the entire national forest up there, basically from the South Platte River <laughs> and the Pike National Forest. Sounds like a game board. And I told my under sheriff, go up there, and I said, we'll assign somebody up there full time, and uh, I might go up and relieve this guy of his, his duties and so forth. And, we went up there, and uh, and at that time it was tough up there. We had bikers and all kinds of things going on up there. A lot of the kids used to have keggers up there and cause all kinds of problems. And uh, the uh, so I sent Don up there, and I said, "Go tell Ray that you know it was you know we appreciate his service and all that, and, but we're going to send somebody up there full time." And he went up there. And, and Ray was very understanding. He says, yeah, he says, I'm, I'm getting a little too old for this. He was 82 years old. 82, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so anyhow, Don says, okay, well, we appreciate it. And he said, we'll get back to you. We'll get you some kind of a plaque or certificate for your time. And he starts to leave and Ray says, well, do you want your gun back? Yeah. This is hilarious. Do you want your gun back? And Don says, we gave you a gun? He says, oh yeah, the previous sheriff gave me a gun. Well, he hands the gun back to Don, and it was rusted shut. Really? It was a revolver, and it was rusted. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my lord, this poor guy's up here making traffic stops and running into bikers and stuff like that. If he ever had to use his gun, he'd have been killed. Yeah. But that was the prevailing attitude here when I took over. So anyhow... Uh, so anyhow, we had a small substation up there later on because we actually ended up assigning two people up there and uh, I convinced the, the new sheriff up there, uh, Ron Beckham, when he came in in 90, when did he come in? I can't remember when he came in, but anyhow, he came in right after Harold Bray and uh, he assigned somebody up there. So we built a little substation and, uh, well, we didn't build it, it was a, it was a little a building that we used as a substation. And, uh, so anyhow, uh, there used to be a criminal up there that uh, kind of had a, uh, ended up killing about five people over a period of time. His name was uh, Julian Gabriel. Do you know the story on Julian? No. Well, Julian had a place they used to call the hideout, and all the criminals would go there, and it was right where you cross the bridge into Jefferson County. And uh, he found out we built a substation. Well, he ended up setting it on fire because he didn't want a substation up there. So we ended up going up there and arresting him. And uh, he got 40 years. He got 40 years wow. on, on that. But we went in uh, to his house to arrest him and so forth. And he had a dartboard on the wall with my picture in the middle. The really? dart stuck <laughs> right, in, <laughs> right in my forehead. Yeah. And that kind of scares you when you know the guy's probably killed about five people. So I have, that was our first substation. And then uh, we had another other places where officers could go and write reports. But the first real one was right there at Lincoln and uh, Yosemite. I promised that I would try to get something up in the northern part of the, of the, the county. county because... Uh, you ever do anything over in Parker? 
No, no, no. When Parker at that time uh, started to have their own police department back in 83. And, uh, but uh, no, no, we never, I don't, I don't even know if there's a need over there because really uh, they can manage that by going over uh, the roads and so forth. Yeah. And, and they have enough officers today where they're on the road pretty much all the time and cover pretty much all the districts. So, well, the silence range has grown. Oh, yeah. The yeah. central part and the west side. Mm -hmm. We've got a substation now in yeah. the Highlands Ranch. On my street? Yeah. I tried to get street. Him. You want to tell I tried, the story? I tried to get him to put a parking meter. Tepper, so, got, a, Tepper so. got a park named after him. You got a street named after you. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Christensen right. got a justice center named after him. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, that was a surprise. I didn't know that they were. When did that all happen? Uh, well, they ended up turning that, the building over there on Yosemite over to other branches of county government to build a station over here. And um, God, I don't even know how long it's been open now. What has it been? I don't remember when. 10 years maybe? Got built. Yeah. 10 years maybe? And uh, But they surprised me. I didn't know they were going to name it after yeah. me. Nice I, had no, I had no idea that they were going to They have a dedication? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's when I found out about it. Yeah. Yeah, so. But, but that was nice of him. I, I appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. That's where Zach was uh, headquartered, I guess. The what? I, I guess that's where. Um, Zach oh, Zach. Was, oh, Zach. Where yeah. Zach was headquartered. Yeah. Yeah. Night shift in that area would be the obviously the, the closest responding place for. Right. No, I didn't know Carver Zach. Canyon. I didn't know Zach, but yeah. I do know his father. So. Yeah. Yeah, his dad was uh, a sheriff and had become his good. sheriff while I was the, when I, when I left sheriff, I became the deputy director for the post commission. Okay. Well, Steve, you were term limited. And in yes. 2003, you had to leave, even right. though at the end of 20 years, that probably was a good breaking point anyway. Correct. What did you do at that point? Um, Actually, I rested for about uh, five or six months <laughs> and took a break. And then uh, I was asked by the Attorney General if I would be interested in coming to work for the Post Commission, which is the Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, because I had been uh, the longest serving member of law enforcement uh, and served in that position. And I had started several different projects about around training and uh, we had uh, started a, a big statewide training program for police officers. And he said, would you like to come and run that? And I said, sure. I said, only two conditions. Once, one is, I, I, I can only work four days a week. I said, I don't want to work more than four days a week. And two, if you ask me a question, you're going to get the answer that I think is correct, and you're not going to get a political answer, because I'm very outspoken. So anyhow, that was Ken Salazar, and he says, oh, he says, I can agree to that. And so anyhow, I ended up being uh, the deputy director for the Post Commission and ran the, uh, the statewide training programs, which is a bunch of dollars that come from your uh, uh, license plates. I think it's 50 cents now, it was a quarter at the time, went to train police officers statewide. So I helped set up that program. I served in that job for about five years, and then Dave Weaver, the, the sheriff here in Douglas County, uh, he, I told him that I was about ready to leave the state, and I said, I've had enough of state government. <laughs> and uh, uh, so anyhow, I, uh, he said, well, would you be willing to come out here and help run the, the training facility out here? And I said, sure. So I was serving in the training program for a while, and then they actually moved me out to uh, the training facility here in uh, on the Highlands Ranch uh, area. Where was your uh, office when you worked for Post? It was right there at the Attorney General's office. Downtown? Yeah, second floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah I had an office overlooking uh, Colfax and uh, what was the cross street? Lincoln? Mm -hmm. Something yeah. like that. I Something like that. I know. But anyhow, uh, I enjoyed the job, but I, I don't want to get into the politics of state government, but uh, it's really, after being a sheriff and 
being able to get things accomplished. Working for state government was not my thing. Mm -hmm. Too bureaucratic, too demotivating, and uh, really kind of stifled your uh, creativity. And uh, it's something I can't deal with. So well, your next opportunity is to come back home and come back home, and yeah, and help them out. Down what here. programs did you develop when they brought you back to do training? Well, um, actually, I didn't develop the actual training programs. What I did was I was assigned out there at the facility to, put the, to, to manage the budget for the foundation, to uh, do long-range planning, to help facilitate the uh, operations of the board of directors, and uh, that was basically it. And, but I was only, gonna, I was only a part-time employee. I said, I don't want to work full-time anymore, so I worked. Uh, two 10 hour days and uh, during this is 2008 2009 yes 2008 and then I uh, just retired again from that job uh, uh, this last October mm -hmm. and so I was out there for, for several years but but we added uh, all kinds of digital uh, systems out there for training we added a, a big uh, it's, it's like a half of auditorium and a half uh, uh, defensive tactics room for training officers, and it has digital firearms and classrooms. Uh, we added uh, the uh, live fire shoot house. We've added a, what they call it simula simulations uh, training program out there. We developed a lot of the ranges, expanded them, and so mm -hmm. forth. Then I worked with Dave McCaslin, who is uh, the... Yeah. the uh, the manager out there and uh, getting things done and paved roads those all those roads are unpaved I developed a program where they can get the roads paved for a reasonable amount of me amount of money and uh, all kinds of things I just on your watch Ron King had his and his partner's unfortunate uh, accident yeah. when did the road into the law enforcement training center get named the Ron King Trail? It was, uh, I'm guessing it was right after I left. After they, you know, when we started paving the road. After, after I left. 2003 or? It was uh, later. I believe it was around 2005 or something like that. After the, uh, after his, that was not a good time, believe me. Yeah. Uh, Ron King and I were not only, he was not only my employee, but he was a pretty good friend. So. Yeah. And his wife, or his wife, his fiance was my administrative assistant. So. While you were the 20 year sheriff, any uh, cases or incidents come to mind that were particularly notable that you'd like to talk about? I don't want to really get into too many cases as such. Uh, we had a lot of them, and uh, or, su or successes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if winning cases is a success. It's uh, <laughs> we did our job. And we did it pretty well. Uh, we did have one funny incident that uh, we had talked about, and that is the the clam bake. Maybe I ought to bring it up okay. at this time. Back what, in. What was the clam bake? The clam bake was, in reality, an illegal gambling operation that was overlooked by a lot of political folks here in the, the state of Colorado and uh, a lot of uh, well to do individuals that used to go up there in Indian Creek for uh, approximately three or four days and they would gamble and they would fly in lobsters and uh, clams from the East Coast and they would have this big bake and everybody would drink and have their fun and, and gamble and uh, strictly illegal, no, no licensing for alcohol, distributing alcohol, uh, the gambling was illegal and uh, um, so we got wind of it and uh, at that time there was a lot of pressure on me to Start enforcing some of these liquor laws because we had a lot of teenage deaths and from uh, keggers and things like that, and the people were really getting upset about the safety of the roads and the accidents and things like that, and they weren't happy about the illegal gambling. And 
So we ended up raiding it up there, and uh, there turned out to be a lot of very influential people up there, <laughs> and including the Justice of the Supreme Court. Hmm. And uh, he, uh, he had been imbibing a little bit, and he told one of my lieutenants to sit down, and uh, he said, uh, I'm writing an injunction uh, against this raid. <laughs> and my lieutenant, quote, and I didn't find out until afterwards what he said. He says, he says, I don't care who you are. He says, sit down and shut up. <laughs> and every time after I ever saw this justice, he would always bring that up. He was always still mad about that. But, but it turned out that we seized a whole bunch of uh, assets, proceeds from the gambling operation and uh, the alcohol uh, was all determined to be illegal. And uh, it was all turned over to us under asset forfeiture laws because the, the, the actual persons running the various gambling tables all had convictions under RICO. As well. Yeah. And <laughs> they were all uh, organized crime figures that had been running the gambling operation. Yeah. So, uh, so anyhow, it turned out well for us, and the people took notice that we weren't going to put up with that stuff anymore. I take it they didn't do the clam bake after that? They did not ever do the clam bake yeah. after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. But I thought it was a funny story. When, yeah. yeah. Organized crime in Douglas County, has that been much of an issue? No, we've had, well, only in that one instant did we have any really exposure to really organized crime. We've had a lot of uh, incidences where we've met up with uh, uh, the the white the right wing type of extremists, mm. the uh, the We the People group. Uh, they actually uh, issued a warrant for my arrest to take me out to the public square and hang me one time. And uh, uh, and uh, you got to be, be important to be hung in effigy. Yeah, well, they wanted to really hang me, I guess. But anyhow, uh, but no, actually, once they knew that we were becoming a top-notch agency and that we were no nonsense, uh, they, most of those people moved on. Yeah. You know, we have our strange ones pop up once in a while. But uh, <clears throat> at one point, someone told me the story that they thought that historically Douglas County is where. Um, People doing bad things in Denver or Arapahoe came and just dumped bodies. Yeah, that, that was us for the so you were years. The, you were the repository when somebody needed to dump a body someplace. They would right. come right. to your county. They would uh, come even, Maybe even prior to you being there. But. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I live, like I'd say, up in Surrey Ridge there. One day on my way to work, before they developed that frontage road that goes on the east side of the highway now. It used to get on right there at uh, right. Surrey Ridge. I was on my way to work and I'm, I'm looking in the bar ditch was a, was a body. So I discovered a body on my way to work where somebody had dumped the body. And uh, eventually it, that led to the arrest of uh, Vincent Groves, if you know who Vincent Groves was. I don't. He was a character uh, in the Denver metropolitan area that was uh, picking up uh, prostitutes, killing them, and then dumping them in various areas of the thing. And it turned out that based on our, our, our body and the, the new science of DNA, he was the first person in Colorado to be convicted of murder for that case in Colorado. Based, based on, on DNA, based on DNA yeah. Mm. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. But for the sheriff to find the actual body on his way to work, his office job, <laughs> yeah. was uh, kind of an interesting thing. So. But, uh, but I think any rural community that's next to, uh, uh, at that time we were pretty rural, it, that's next to a metropolitan area, you know, criminals tend to, dump their evidence mm -hmm. outside their city. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, 
Jim Tepper was the first uh, Colorado project manager, if you will, right. for Mission Viejo when they came out here in the late 70s. <clears throat> you started in 83 as the sheriff, and Tepper, I don't think, retired until the late 80s, early 90s at this point. Any interaction stories you'd like to tell with Jim? He's well, kind of a colorful guy. Jim is a colorful guy and still a very good friend of mine. And I, we still have lunch occasionally, and uh, we, uh, he sends me his emails all the time, and I try to respond as caustically as possible. But uh, yeah, there's a, there a funny story about Jim and, and the impacts. He calls me up one day and he says, come down to my office. He says, uh, I have something for you. Well, when Mission had originally developed Highlands Ranch and presented the plans, they said that they would help with mitigating some of the impact of the community on Douglas County. And we were expecting things like car, you know, you know patrol cars and things like that, that they would uh, purchase for us and that type of thing. And I get to his office and him, Joe, him, Joe Blake are snickering in the corner, you know, and, uh, and he says, uh, he said, well, we saw the kind of car you drove, which was an old beat up Ford LTD or something like that. It had up like 250,000 miles on it. He says, we bought you a brand new Cadillac. And I looked at him and I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, are you trying to get me thrown out of office? And they started laughing and laughing and laughing. And they finally said, now we actually bought you a patrol car. I and mean, it was a Ford Bronco. But they had their time of their life kidding me about buying me a brand new Cadillac to drive around in. And he still brings it up today. Does he? Yeah, he still brings it up today. So if you ever see him, tell him Zotos expects his Cadillac. I will. I'll ask him about and, that. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but anyhow, he, he, he was quite a character, but uh, an extremely nice man. You, know, just, you couldn't ask for a better partner, both him and Joe Blake, and like I say, Art Cook, and uh, Steve Arminson, did you remember Steve, and uh, uh, all those you guys. Craig McCallum, too? He was yes, a Craig McCallum too. picture. Yeah, he took over after uh, After Park. Jim retired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the McCallum was very supportive, too. This, I don't even know, does he still live here? No. McCallum? No. Um, I haven't seen him for quite a while. I think he has a, he has a son that does. Oh, okay. And we did a historical society, did a program out at uh, Cheese Ranch oh. this fall, last September, whatever. And he came and talked about when he was a 16-year-old kid, oh. that his dad, Craig, would send him over there and right. say, hey, do this at the Cheese Ranch. Oh. <laughs> this was in the early 80s before yeah. The mission decided that it was a, yeah. it was a vandalism site <clears throat> at that point, mm. and uh, that they ought to raise it, and they did. They got a lot of feedback, but... Oh, and after him was uh, uh, Bert Silva, who when, uh, when uh, Shea yeah. bought out Mission. Yeah. Bert was a great guy, too, and now he's he is the man for all the Shea. He lives out there in Newport Beach, California. Yeah, he, he was a great guy too. So, I, I, you know, if every developer and could be like the people that were here, and and some of the people over at, uh, at the, the mobile company, uh, the impacts on all government services would be a lot less. Good. Yeah. So, I have nothing but admiration for you guys here. You had much uh, interaction over the years with the Metro District. Actually, uh, one of your uh, Metro District people is sitting on our board now. And who is that? Renee one? Anderson. Who? Renee Anderson. I don't know Renee. She's on the. Uh, it's the Metro District board. Hmm? She works with. Uh, is that the same one that? Forrest Dykstra, you know Forrest? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that who? Yeah, with Decker. Isn't that the Metro District? It is. Yeah, well, she's on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Any interaction with Terry Nolan? Yes. Uh, well, when Terry, I was sheriff. I mean, Terry's been there, gee, 20 years now. Yeah, when I was sheriff, yes. 
Yeah, he was a good guy too. I always got along with him very well. And, uh, so, the yeah, ex-Navy guy. What? He was an ex-Navy guy. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. aviator. That's right. I used to go, or I, up until a few years ago when everybody got so old, uh, I used to go on a houseboat every year to Lake Powell with all naval aviators. You're talking about rowdy people. <laughs> so I don't know if Terry was that way, but if he's anything like that. Uh, well, getting back to Tefer, whatever you talked about, cars. Uh, you want to tell the story of um, fast cars donated to the county? Fast cars? Are you talking about the ones? I don't remember anything about uh, fast cars. Your uh, your Facebook page has a picture of a car decorated with flames and everything else that might have been, that looked like a looked like a hot that wasn't uh, that wasn't related to Teffer. Mustang or something that wasn't related to Teffer. I'm can't I can't remember who no, donated. Not Teffer. That's oh, I'm, oh. On the, I'm on the I'm on the liking fast cars track. Here. Well, we did we tried to do a lot of things that would connect us with the youth of the community. The, not only did we have other issues when I took sheriff, the office of sheriff, but we had a very bad relationship with the youth of the community of Douglas County. So I, I started inducing or introduction of a lot of uh, programs that were relating to kind of bridging that gap. One of my first acts was to develop the uh, uh, Explorer Post at, right. at the, the Scout Program. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, that was one of my first uh, programs that I started. And it got to be uh, quite a little group, and I got to serve on the National Law Enforcement Exploring Committee for about seven or eight years. And uh, we put on programs all over the United States. But, uh, but anyhow, the, the, the race car was uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, we have a, a Camaro that's going to be given to us and uh, it needs work on the engine and so forth. And uh, law enforcement had just started developing this race -a cop program up there at Vandermeer. And I said, well, let's do it. I said, if it isn't going to cost us a lot of money. So they got the kids at uh, Douglas County High School to take it on as a project to rebuild the engine and that kind of thing in their shops, their shop program or whatever it is up there. And uh, we got somebody to donate uh, the paint job and that type of thing. And so it kind of grew from there. So we had that race cop program from the early 90s. And I, th I think it's still going today, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Cool. So yeah, so that was, a, that was a fun project. What was your 58 Impala, your first car? No, it was my second car. Your second car? Uh, my first car was a 1955 Pontiac Super Chief. <laughs> my second car was the 58 Chevy Impala. Oh, you saw that on the website too. Then I had a uh, 65 uh, GTO, which I want you to know, in 1965 I bought that brand new $3,600 out the door with every option, every wow. racing option you could buy. Yep. And uh, that's the one they wrote the song about. Yeah. 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 I bought that brand new, thirty-six hundred bucks. I remember how much. That was big money that's back big in those money. days. Yeah. In '65. So, and uh, so I was kind of into racing. I used to do some drag racing and things like that in mm -hmm. my younger days. And so. In California. Yeah. 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 I didn't do it out here. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Paul, you have any questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, yes. Uh, did you ever have to make any trips up here to Highlands Ranch dealing with uh, situations here, not necessarily at the mansion, but with problems here in this area? You know, not so much myself. The department obviously did. You know, after my pretty much my first term, well, I would go out periodically and ride with some of the deputies and some of the supervisors to see how things were going and so forth. Most of my time was spent with budgets, with dealing with commissioners, with uh, dealing with uh, training programs, 
that type of thing. So I really didn't get out myself a lot, except when I would ride along. Uh, every once in a while I'd answer a call myself. I was pretty involved in that. The only time I remember really a big issue is we had a serious sexual assault issue up here at one time. And uh, we had a community meeting over at the rec center, the Northridge Rec Center, mm -hmm. where uh, we gathered the community uh, to kind of bring them up to date on uh, the, uh, the sexual assaults that were going on. It was around real estate, I think, believe it was around real estate. Uh, you might remember. I've, I've been involved in so many different crimes over the years, it's hard to remember. But I think it had to be, it was involved with somebody that was setting up, coming out and looking at houses, calling real estate agents. They would see their picture of a good looking woman that was a real estate agent, and then they would uh, sexually assault them. And that was going on pretty much in the South Metro area and in Highlands Ranch. And I remember we had a community meeting, but uh, I participated in a lot of your activities up here your 4th of July celebrations and things like that. And I have not, uh, it's kind of a funny story too. One of the 4th of July, you know Vicki Starkey? You yeah. know Vicki? No, sure. sure. <laughs> Vicki called me up and, uh, Halfleck, what was her name? She works, she, she still works for Shea Holmes, but she was the, Vicki and her were kind of the community Organizers, you know, and they used to organize all the events. Well, we had, you had just opened up Falcon Park there by the Highlands Ranch High School. And they said, we're having a big 4th of July celebration. Can you come over and be a judge of the various events down there? So I was a chilly judge. And then I went over there and uh, they had a bicycles. The kids would decorate their bicycles. And uh, uh, they asked me to be a judge on that. And... Uh, Obviously, I picked the wrong bicycle, but this one woman came up to me and she said, uh, I don't want to say the, the words she used, but she called me an uh, a-hole and uh, this and that for not picking your kid and gave me the finger. And I was saying, holy crap. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I said, I get enough about, about uh, budget issues and, uh, and crime issues. I don't need to be harassed over uh, not picking the right bi design bicycle. So if that lady listens to this, I hope she <laughs> is embarrassed. Yeah, well, that's, <clears throat> that's been a long time activity, the, yeah. the bike uh, thing at the beginning of the parade, and right. yeah. that still continues to this day. Yeah. I, I got an award out here too, uh, the Sweet 16 event. Did you, were you around when the, they had the Sweet 16 event over there at, uh, the big park. What's the big park by the post office? Um, Heritage. Heritage, yeah. yeah. They had a big event there one time and they gave me a, a big award for being one of the 16 most influential people in Highlands Ranch and I was really proud of that. And, but uh, uh, so anyhow, yeah, that, was, that was fun too. So. Yeah. You had much dealings with the uh, school district over the years? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I watched that school district when run. Rick was the superintendent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was only one high school in the whole county when I became sheriff. They had just started. That was Highlands Ranch. No, that, no, that was, oh, that that was County. Was county. Yeah, and then they built yeah. Ponderosa and then Highlands Ranch. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we did a lot with uh, the school districts. Uh, we started the the school resource officer program that still exists today. Sure. I started all that and uh, worked with them uh, closely on every issue. I used to even personally go out and help them do security on the football games and those kinds mm -hmm. of things yeah. and uh, uh, always enjoyed that. Um, I have an interesting story about one of my daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which one? Uh, Stacy. Stacy was a big, big softball athlete and all that. And, I think she still holds the batting average uh, title for. She got uh, to Highlands Ranch. Or? She went to Douglas County. Douglas County. County. Yeah. She lives here in Highlands Ranch, but she lives right off of Veniford there. But um, uh, at that time, they had just dissolved county's involvement in recreational programs, and uh, they wanted 
the softball people and the baseball people all to get together and develop their own boards and run them independently. And uh, uh, so I ended up getting on that board. And they actually, this is the, the, the theory of, it's, it's kind of apropos to what's going on today. They wanted the girls to go out and solicit money so the boys could have uniforms. <laughs> and I said, that is not going to happen. <laughs> but, but kind of getting to the school thing, well, my daughter, when she got into high school, she was a pretty good athlete and, and a hell of a batter. And uh, Douglas County didn't want to start a girls softball team because they would have to pay for it. And I went and made a presentation before the the, commission, the uh, board of directors or whatever they call themselves. And uh, they didn't want to fund. So we ended up having to put together people that would uh, help fund the Douglas County High School softball team rather than the district doing it. And I was a little mad about that for a while. And, but it ended up that they ended up uh, having to do it because of uh, what was the federal proposition title nine. as a title nine. Yeah. They ended up having to do some of that and uh, now they have a pretty good team. But uh, in those days, uh, and we had a pretty good softball team mm -hmm. for only one year. Douglas County's always had yeah. good teams. Mr. Bonacquista, uh, he was the uh, baseball coach. He did it for nothing. And uh, but. Uh, and she got a couple of scholarships, but she never took them. She ended up getting step, academic. <clears throat> my stepdaughter played softball for, oh, uh, really? for Highlands Ranch. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, good. Yeah, that's she's a good huge pitcher. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter was short stuff. All the activities, though, seemed to be at, at the club level, really. Yeah. The high school season was so short by comparison. Yeah. That most of the activity that if you were a parent, you spent a lot of time and money in the off season. Yeah. That's where the learning went on. My, her, her daughter's a hell of an athlete now. She's, uh, she just won last night against 429 participants. She won the Excel uh, Invitational for uh, gymnastics mm -hmm. up in, uh, in Weed Ridge. And she came in first among all the girls from six to 18. And uh, she won the state championship last year. And, and she was invited, she's going to uh, Orlando and, couple of weeks for a big national uh, competition down there, so yeah. she's quite a little girl. Hayden Seymour, if you ever want to look her up. So. Something else I was going to ask you about here too, you've, uh, you've done a lot of progressive things for the police department here. Mm -hmm. Has that come about by your past experience or has it been brought about by thinking outside the box? Oh, a little of both. I, like I say, I came from uh, you know, one of the biggest agencies in the United States in Los Angeles County, and uh, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on education. They put a lot of emphasis on uh, training and so forth. So I already had that mindset when I came here. And then my exposure to the railroad did the same thing. They put a lot of money, they put a lot of emphasis on motivation, uh, problem solving, those types of things. And I brought all that to the Sheriff's Department. But you have to realize how bad things were when I took office. It was very easy to improve. <laughs> it, was really, it was really sad because they had a lot of very good people and uh, they just were demotivated and uh, uh, they had no leadership. Uh, they were demoralized by the, the constant investigations and uh, uh, they were embarrassed by some of their own people that uh, had gotten in trouble. And, but uh, if you really, I mean this is my philosophy, my personal philosophy, if you train somebody well and you pay them well and you provide opportunities to get better, that's a hell of a lot more of a, a way to be fiscally sound in providing services. You'll have better government. retention. Right, absolutely. Yeah. My uh, last 10 years, 
of being sheriff, my turnover in the commission ranks, that's deputy and mm -hmm. above, was 1%. Well, that's nothing. That's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. 1%. Yeah. Doing a lot of things right. Yeah. yeah. People loved it there. Well, I'll give you the final word. Are there any other things you'd like to tell us on this before we wrap up? No, I just hope that uh, this isn't given over to a special prosecutor or anything. <laughs> and, uh, that <laughs> and that, uh, uh, I mean, there are so many stories, it's hard to get them all out. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk to you. I, I'm very proud of what I did. And I'm proud of how our people have uh, uh, progressed over the years. And uh, every once in a while in the paper, they say Zoto started a dynasty, dynasty, and that's not so true. I mean, the people that have become sheriff and have advanced through the ranks, while a lot, most of them started with me, I'm proud of most of those people. Uh, they have progressed well. They're doing a lot of the things that I think need to be done. And uh, so I'm very happy. I've had a hell well, of a life. I think a testament to your leadership even after that is just look at the support recently here with uh, uh, the funeral for, for Zach. Yeah, they did a wonderful job on that. Yeah. I was sick that day. That's community, <laughs> community support was right. just outstanding. 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 You know, just Absolutely. way, way over the top. Yeah. You know, far more than I think most people would uh, have expected. Right. And you know, I always used to tell developers and so forth that there's nothing worse for your selling your community than to have problems with crime. You yeah. know, so so we're an important part of uh, marketing your community. Oh, absolutely. You know, and uh, so, and, and I think they understood that. Yeah, I mean, Highlands Ranch was promoted yeah. as a safe neighborhood. Absolutely. A safe, family-oriented neighborhood. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the rest of the county primarily yeah. is as well. I mean, this isn't just Highlands Ranch. It's a very, uh, very safe community. Things are changing as we urbanize, but uh, some of that you can't, yeah. can't yeah. have. That much, so. Okay. Well, on behalf of the Historical Society, thanks again for oh, well, thank you. sharing your thoughts with us today. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too long. <laughs>